Hi, good morning. Um, welcome everyone to, to this, today's webinar, where we're going to be looking at digital rights and making sure that you have the rights to use existing material. I'm Linda Coburn, I'm the uh, web, webinar moderator on behalf of the space. So I'll be doing the setup and be leading th you through the session today. Um, before we get into the content of what we're doing, I just want to give you a few practical um, guidelines about how we work and, and what you'll see today. Um, so to start with, um, as you can see, the webinar is going to be recorded and then it'll be made available on our website afterwards for anybody who wants that would find it useful, wants to share it with their colleagues and so on. We also have Nicola with us today, who is our live captioner, um, and she'll be captioning the whole discussion. So if you would find captions helpful, there'll be there's a link in the chat explaining to you how to get to those captions um, and the link is at the bottom of the page. And the third practical thing to say is that we use the written chat function um, because we're in webinar format, so your cameras and mics are turned off. That's the place for questions directed to the panel. Um, any advice or ideas you want to share amongst yourselves and just kind of comments and questions generally. So the communication is all through that, that chat function. Um, those are the kind of the, the outlines of, of how we'll work. So I just wanted to, we've got a couple of slides to show you. The first one is an introduction to the space. I'm not sure that everybody will know about us as an organization, but here in essence is, is what we do. So the space has, um, is an Arts Council England IPSO support organization. And really we're the UK's digital commissioning and development agency for the arts and cultural sector. And, um, much of our work is in commissioning organizations and helping them to create work online that really impacts on audiences and is effective for audiences and so the webinar program that we run is part of a sort of skills development process but we're really drawing on all the work that we've done with that huge number of organizations and where we've seen successes and we know what's worked so we use case studies and examples in the webinar of which this is one of the series so that's a little bit about us and I'll just also show you who we're going to hear from today and give you a sense of what we'll cover. So Fiona, who's our chief exec, she's really going to talk about, you know, why this is important to the space and also to introduce our digital rights toolkit, which uh, any of you can, you can download and again share with um, colleagues and others. Um, so that'll, that'll be our introduction. And then we've Jamie Smith, who's um, a lawyer and a, a partner in Sheridan's law firm. He really looks after the interactive part of their work. But one important thing to say is um, this webinar is our speakers are all offering general guidance and their ideas and experience on how to go about clearing material. Um, we're not getting into very specific details and what we are not doing is giving you legal advice. So if you had a particular question that needed um, legal support, you can't take that from this webinar, we would recommend you go and speak to a lawyer about it. Um, so we've two other speakers, both of whom have also worked with the space on different arts projects and you'll hear examples from their work. That's Jill Davis, who um, comes at it from a producer's point of view and Steve Bergson, who told me he likes to be required, referred to as a content acquirer and we'll speak to him a little bit more about what that is when we hear from Steve. Um, and we've been sent some excellent questions in advance by people who are attending the webinar. So we'll be going through all of those questions after the break and also making sure that we cover things like um, what kinds of materials covered by copyright, how you use content that you've found online and on social channels, um, lots of examples of real lots of real examples and some of the creative workarounds that people have come up with. Lots of tips on managing the process and also managing the budget and keeping costs down where possible. Thinking about the future and also we'll cover some of the common misconceptions that exist around rights, the kinds of the, the phrases that people use and what they really mean and what their impact is for you. So that's the session and we'll be finished at um, half past 12. Okay, so that's it. 
if you have any questions that you want to ask at any point, um, put them into the chat and we'll um, we'll I'll I'll put them to the speakers at the kind of, at the right moments when we've got a bit of time to think about questions from the audience. So as as the as the plan says, the first speaker is Fiona Morris, the chief exec from the space for the space. So Fiona, would you like to join us? Hello. Indeed. Hi there. Hi there. Hello, thank you for joining us. So, so we're just a really a bit of context really and, and scene setting from you. And obviously we have just relaunched our digital rights toolkit. So I wanted to ask you to sort of frame this and sort of say, why do you think we're looking, why, why are we looking at this now and why are we looking at particular aspects of it? Indeed, indeed. And thank you. Great to have so many people joining us today because I know this covers, you know, a lot of people's interface with with kind of creating digital work. I also wanted to just quickly say that um, today's session is also we do. We are, as Linda said, um, uh, one of the national portfolio organisations for England, but we are also regularly supported and working with Creative Scotland. And so it was through conversations with Creative Scotland that we were able to add this additional webinar to our program this year. Um, so thank you to them and great to have lots of colleagues from Scotland joining us for this session. Um, but yeah, I, as Linda said, we have recently relaunched our digital rights toolkit just because it felt like it needed an update. And also, I think we were feeling like it, it, it needed to be more comprehensive. Um, now, I think what I would start by saying is, look, at the space, you know, we exist in order to, to kind of help and support artists and cultural organisations to make the most of communicating with audiences and visitors online using digital tools. Um, but I think we have to be really honest with you and say that that does come at a price. Um, and rights is one of the issues that really become infinitely more complicated the minute you are talking about publishing work in a digital context. You all know that you know it, it is already complicated enough to consider third party copyright when you're creating collaborative artworks. Um, it's always been complicated when you're creating work, when you're curating other people's work or presenting any kind of work in a live context. But in those contexts, you are at least geographically limited. You are limited in time for how long you're presenting that work. Um, and, and it is in that live context with that limited audience coming to it. Um, but it, that already means that you're involved in conversations with numerous copyright owners, from performers to publishers to archive sources, literary references, etc., that becomes infinitely more complicated when you are talking about taking on the role and the responsibility of publishing, because that's what you're doing. When you put digital work out into the digital and online arena, you are publishing it. And that does come with increased responsibilities. Um, and that might also then kind of take you on into, into broadcast media as well. So suddenly you're looking to acquire and discuss with those rights holders all of those underlying rights. You're now potentially looking at them being seen worldwide. You're looking at them being seen forever. And you're looking at them being shown on very many different forms of media from online to broadcast, you know, in, in the case of performance, sometimes even in cinema. Um, so. To be clear, there are no quick fixes. What we wanted to make sure with the Digital Rights Toolkit was that we put together um, a set of advice that was as comprehensive as possible to help you prepare, to, to consider what you need to think about in a, well in advance of publishing any kind of digital content um, and to really think through the implications of any of those underlying rights in, in reference to the piece of work or the curated project that you're publishing there. Um, one thing I would say is an absolute certainty, and I know all the other contributors to today's webinar are going to say this as well, the more homework you can do in advance, the better. Being really clear about how many and what third party rights are involved in your work. Um, I would cite an example of a performance work that we that we worked with a dance company and um, choreographed work on a stage, but in amongst the performance, 
um, the kind of props on the set, there was a scene where people were dancing with 1950s record album sleeves tucked under their arms. Those album sleeves were visible on camera. Those have copyright. Somebody designed those album sleeve covers. You need to clear for those album covers to be included in a dance work that you're publishing online. So, so it's really about being really forensic about where and what you have in within the artwork that you're talking about. And the big thing is to approach, you know, to be really clear about who those copyright holders are, approach all of them or their representatives for permission to use the copyright work well in advance um, and have a complete shopping list of all the things that you might want to do with the finished work. You don't have to pay unless you actually use it, but ask them first if they would be OK about it being published online, it being available for broadcast, it being available for any other form of exhibition. You can have that conversation in principle and you can get some sense of A, are they going to agree to it? B, what kind of money should you be setting aside? Um, and then if you've got those answers and if some of them are not the ones you want because it's too expensive or because for some other reason the rights are not available, um, then you've got an opportunity to think about what the alternatives might be. So as I say, there are no surefire solutions and really easy ways through this, but we hope that the Digital Rights Toolkit gives you a good sense of where to start and how to proceed. And hopefully advice from our contributors today will also help. I'm going to hand back to Linda. Thank you so much, Fiona. That's a great over, overall introduction. Thank you. And I'm going to ask Jamie to join me next. Jamie's our first panellist. Hello. There, there's, Hi, everyone. He's, he's, Jamie's explained that um, the way his office is set up, he's, you'll, you'll see he's quite little in the back of his screen. But <laughs> if, if I haven't help. shrunk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but you can, if, if live captions would help you to, to see, you know, if you can't see Jamie's mouth, then that, that's a way around that. So thank you so much, Jamie. So sort of following on really from what Fiona's, um, Fiona was talking about there, will you give us, we'll get more into the detail in a minute, but can you just give us an introduction to yourself and your role? Yeah, sure. So morning, everyone. Um, I recognise a few familiar names from the participant list. So um, good to sort of meet everyone who are not um, already known to me. Um, I'm a partner at Sheridan's. Um, I co-head our interactive team. Sheridan's is a, a sort of leading media law firm. Um, and we work with clients across a lot of content um, sectors. So whether it's the films, arts, uh, interactive media, gaming, AR, VR, all, obviously all the high sort of topics um, and those sort of in sort of the AI space in particular as well. Um, those not just sort of using AI, but actually the platforms themselves. And we really sort of operate from a, I mean, this, this topic is quite key. Um, it, it is really the fundamental intersection of what we do. We advise basically fundamentally on the use of rights, how rights can be um, obtained, how rights can be exploited. And also then obviously the tricky side, if, if you don't sort of uh, unfortunately fall foul of, um, of someone's rights, how to sort of navigate those tricky situations. Um, a lot of us are in, come from different commercial backgrounds in-house. Myself, I was in a production entity, The Mill, for many years, and then previously Sony PlayStation. So they come from a, we come from a real practical sense point. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, and James, so in, in this webinar, as Fiona set up, we're focusing on clearing the rights to materials that already exist, which is only kind of Part, it's part of what you cover, isn't it? We're not looking at the contracting and that side of things today. So we're particularly focused on um, what's called literary, artistic, film, sound recordings. Um, and again, I'll note to the audience that we're not covering music as in performed music in any detail today because it's a big subject of itself and we've got other resources and we'll come back to that. But um, but. I was very interested then in, in the Copyright Act and what was covered by it. And when I started talking to you about this webinar, you said to me, I don't really come at this from the Copyright Act. I look at it another way, that everything has rights. And I wonder, just as a setup, whether you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So I, I, the reason I said that is really because I think I've probably only referenced the Copyright Act in in two or three conversations this year, if, if that. And it's not, 
this is this is the point when when you're looking at creative content it's not necessarily about delving into the particular sections of the copyright act everyone on this on this um participant is is a approaching this from a creative background you don't need a lawyer or someone to say well this is what the copyright act says this section says x y and z you really need a practical approach and that's why i said really we should turn it on its head and say well there are laws out there i mean like the copyright act, there are we, there are obviously laws in the us and there are other laws globally which cover this and i think fiona mentioned it um, on the introduction the, a lot of people operate in a global um sort of in a global manner and these productions are released they're globally accessible and so to that point why just focus on the uk copyright act instead if you look at guiding principles then they will set you on a good sort of stead um to sort of hopefully have avoid any issues and it's those really i think where we should sort of focus a bit of the time now just on some of those guiding principles mm -hmm. Okay, smashing. Um, do you want to say more about that, or should we? Yeah. So, so my, so I think I, I know we haven't got much time, but my start point with 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 really anything is anything that touches your production, whether it's a film, whether it's a piece of interactive content, whether it's a game, a VR piece, um, a performance, anything that touches it from a from a third party perspective. So I. You haven't asked an employee, an employee being not a freelancer, but someone on payroll to create something. Anything that you get, whether it's from an, an archive, whether it's from a image supplier like Getty or Shutterstock, whether you ask a freelancer to provide some content or whether you just do a simple Google search or even, I mean, we'll come on to AI, but use an AI engine they have rights attached and that's your starting point well uh, there are exceptions we'll come on to those but i'd start from the point anything you pull in has rights attached and so the starting point we always say is almost view this as a spider diagram um, a map of what what have you got at your core you've got your end production your end film your end content what has come in to touch that and almost keep an ip register um, and those who may have been on talks before of mine, this IP register is really your sort of, it, it, it's your guidebook. It's what has happened, who's touched this. And it's very much like the principle that anyone's commissioning a film, so Netflix or Amazon um, or Apple, if they, if they commission a film uh, and pay for a film or pay for a production, they'll always ask for this sort of chain of title. And really what they're saying is, we want to know, is there anything that you've used has it been cleared? Who does it belong to? Have we got the rights? And so basically it's that starting point is your practical point that you're bringing something in, it probably has rights attached. We need to make sure we clear those rights or you take a sensible view on the risk of using that content. At least it's given the consideration. And again, I guess the golden rule um, is really don't just assume that you can, there used to be this, this sort of view um, that you could take an image off the internet and make free changes and it was great and you were golden and you were happy to move forward. That's not the case. Really take the position that if you're taking something from somewhere, it's been created, you have to then respect that there will be some rights attached somewhere. Um, AI platforms accepted to this, um, but that's your starting point and start from there. And that's why I say it's, We've got a short window. This is a topic that obviously takes years and yeah. years to cover, but that's really your fundamental starting point. And then you can start to sort of build from there and, and consider the intricacies of what needs to be cleared to and to the extent. Lovely, thank you. And we've got, um, we'll hear from, from Jill and Steve about sort of two very practical ways that they go about doing this. And they might have slightly different approaches, as you say, because there won't be something, there's not one way of doing it. Okay, so just another couple of questions to, to touch on and we'll go into more detail, I guess, as we go through the session. So, so we're saying that, you know, ev everything has rights and then, so we, it includes things, anything that you find on Instagram or that you find on YouTube or generated by an AI. Do you want to say more about that? 
Yeah, so if we set AI aside for the moment, so Instagram, YouTube, um, Facebook, you've got you've got mixture of rights there. I mean, they're, they're a good example of where you've got a platform involved as the distributor, yeah. Instagram, let's take Instagram, and you've also got the individual contributors. So you're starting from giving a really good example. Let's take a, photo uh, a photograph. You could have a, photo a photograph of, say, an influencer, Oh well, actually, I could give a live example, and it's not com it's not giving any confidential information away. Someone's um, influencer pictures of their interior house that they had on their channel. Someone wants to use those for um, promoting a new business, and they've just taken those images. So, in that case, you have the rights belonging to the influencer, their their sort of their image rights, effectively, the right to sort of use them for commercializing your project. So you've got them, you've got the photographer, right? So let's say the influencer didn't actually take the picture. It was say a photographer, a separate, they've got rights in the actual photog um, photography taken. And then you've got the platform rights in that they will have rights over people just so-called so data mining going on there, taking images without consent. So you've got a whole mixture. And as you can see, just one innocent picture of well, that's someone's apartment with someone in it. You can open up a spider's web of, of, of potential issues there. And everyone may say, well, it's just an image, surely. But this is the point. These images are closely sort of, um, sort of controlled by certain influencers in that example. And so real care has to be taken on that example. And it's the same for the other platforms. The majority of them will have terms and conditions governing, but you're taking content someone's created that content you're wanting to use it so there are rights persisting under that now ai i don't want to spend too much time because again it's a whole topic in its own right but ai is slightly different um, in that there's a lot of cases at the moment around where has the source material come from because the platforms have taken a whole host of source material and then you're using prompts creating something original now the output of that You've just got to be careful because, again, without going into detail, it can contain copyright works. Let's use a simple example. It, a lot, a certain um, AI algorithm has, has stripped Getty images. People are using that but putting out images which still have Getty's watermark. Now, if that doesn't give you an indication of the source of content, then I'm not sure what does. But again, that's been used without rights. And at the moment, the law's trying to play a bit of catch up, but it's still based on fundamental principles that you cannot just use someone else's work without um, their consent. And I guess AI is different because it's bringing all sources together. So in a lot of cases, practically, it may be that someone doesn't recognize their work. It doesn't say you shouldn't still give the same considerations as to whether there should be a clearance concern. And the difference with the AI platforms they absolutely absolve themselves of any liability or responsibility. It's, it's on you. Use, use those platforms at your risk, effectively. Okay, thank you. So um, you, you talk, you've talked about taking a sensible, you know, either clearing the rights or, or taking a sensible view. What, what happens if you don't clear rights? What, what are you taking a sensible view of? <laughs> well... I guess I guess it's the risk of a claim ultimately, um, and the risk of your project being disrupted, and how fundamental is the content that you've used to that. So I know there's some questions that we come on later on, but let's take you. Let's say you've just taken a book which is within st still within copyright. You've used that as the fundamental foundation for an entire film or artistic work or game. If in that case you haven't cleared it correctly you could effectively find that you've, you're subject to a claim which forces you to remove the entire game from, um, from sale or the production um, it, it, because it sort of is integral to it. The risk-based approach is, let's say, I think someone, I think it was Fiona gave the example of an album artwork being used. Now, in context, that may only be featured in, say, 10 seconds of a particular film and it's used just in context it's used in someone's room they're not focusing on the album as as a sort of commercialization of saying this artist has endorsed this production now you may in that circumstance not get anywhere with rights clearance in the sense of you, you just can't get hold of anyone in that sense a risk-based approach might be 
well, if we do go ahead and they ask us to remove it, can we quickly edit it out? Can we re-release it or are we stuck? Or do we think there'll just be a small fee to pay, a license fee? And so that's where I guess we get to the next level advisory on a practical point. And that's, I think the first step is you should always clear where you can. I, I take a little bit more of a practical approach so I say, to saying, well, look, if let's take a practical view. If it is in here, you've done everything you can, should we then sort of be concerned if we do go ahead and release it because you can't now change the content? And so that's that. the risk ultimately though is someone brings a claim um, and they either claim for profits on account of your production or they stop you using the content. Okay, thank you. And um, Jill's our next speaker, so I'll get ask her to get ready to kind of come on. But I'm just thinking about as well as, you know, there's, there's a claim and I'm sure well, Fiona will join us again later. And I, I suppose, you know, there'll be another thing, which is that the, the space and Creative Scotland and Arts Council of England will all have a view on the kind of the morals of <laughs> using people's work and treating it with, res with respect and that they're creative endeavours with respect to. So we might come back to that. So um, thank you very much, um, Jamie. We haven't got any specific questions for you at the moment. So then we'll, I'll invite you back into the panel session a bit later on. And if right. anybody has any questions they'd like to put Jamie, they can add them into chat and we'll feed them back to him. So thank you very much for that. It's really useful and helpful. Brilliant. See you later. Right. Hello. Hello, Jill. Hello. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Will you start, uh, as Jamie did, with a, li a little bit about you and your role as a producer and where, where rights come into it? Sure. So um, I'm a multimedia producer, which means I make um, content for a range of different platforms. So I make radio programmes, I make podcasts, um, short films, um, written features for websites um, and live streaming music as well. So um, I've made uh, Clients include the BBC, National Galleries of Scotland, um, Glasgow Caledonian University. So all the, the content I make, um, I have to think about uh, copyright all the time because I'm quite a lot of times I'm using um, other people's work in my work. So, yeah, it's always at the front of my mind. <laughs> Lovely, and so and you've worked on space projects with the space and, and other arts uh, arts projects as well. And um, so we thought it was a really interesting to so you hear from from Jamie about the kind of the overview and everything. But following on from him, really, just a bit about your process. And we know that you're not you don't sim you don't only deal with rights. It's part of your whole role. I just wanted you to sort of give us a bit of an example of, you know, starting with a project that you've worked on and, and kind of ha how you approach the rights to existing materials. And particularly we're looking at, you know, some of those literary and artistic aspects. Sure. Um, so one project I thought of um, talking about, which would be a good example, is um, a piece I made for uh, a written feature I made for the BBC on... Um, Dali's famous um, Christ of St John and the Cross painting, which is in um, Kelvin Grove Art Gallery in Glasgow. Uh, there's a really interesting story behind that. The director of the, um, the art gallery, when he bought it, there was an outcry in Glasgow because he'd paid so much money um, for this painting. And I think it was the anniversary. So um, the BBC Arts website were looking for features. So I suggested this feature. And it was the first time that I had ever um, dealt with uh, clearing copyright for images. Usually my work at that, up to that point was mainly um, making radio programmes, so it was a new experience for me. So when I, um, this is probably how not to go about, <laughs> um, so I, I learned a lot during this process, so I knew, having talked to um, Glasgow museums, that the director of the art gallery, Tom Honeyman, was very clever in that he also bought the copyright of the image of the painting when he bought the painting. So I thought, great, the copyright lies with Glasgow culture and museums. So it should be fairly easy um, to uh, you know, reproduce the, the painting on the website. Um, but what I discovered was my original plan A was to have a lovely big picture of the painting on the website with some text underneath. 
But um, having spoken to uh, the art gallery, they said, well, yes, you can have an image, um, but you can have a thumbnail image. Um, that's what we'll give you as free. Um, so the tiny wee image. So then um, plan B was, how do I illustrate this feature? So I did a bit more research and found out that um, Dr Honeyman and Salvador Dali had exchanged letters um, during the process of buying the painting and they actually became really good friends. So I thought, great, the letters were held in the National Library of Scotland. I can um, reproduce the letters, uh, that shouldn't be a problem. But um, when I looked into copyright behind the letters, uh, I discovered that the owner, the copyright actually, uh, while the, the letter is owned by the person it was sent to, the copyright is retained by the person who wrote it. So um, I knew uh, that Salvador Dali during his lifetime um, loved making money um, and the foundation that exists, uh, you know, that, that copyrights his work um, is notoriously litigious, you know, so they're always looking out for examples of where the work's been used without permission being given. So um, I wrote to them, I'm a huge Dali fan, and, <laughs> you know, um, explained that the image was, uh, the letters were to be used on a BBC web so website, so it wasn't for commercial use. Um, so they agreed to, um, I could publish the images in a, in a, a certain size on the, the letters, a in a certain size on the website. Um, so I think uh, I also... There were also images that, um, pictures, photos, again, I had to go to um, the Glasgow Museums to clear the, the images. So what uh, I should have done, the way I should have done it is, um, you know, at the very beginning of the project, have a plan A. Um, so I can do this. I, if that doesn't work, plan B. I can do this. And if that doesn't work, plan C. So I learned a lot about how to organise rights when you're, you're creating a piece of content from that experience. So have everything, um, you, you know, have a clear idea of what you want to do in advance, um, have a clear idea of what you can do within the budget you have, um, you know, really do your research into how much things cost, because uh, that will have a massive effect on, you know, what what you're, um, what the, the thing, what you're producing, you know. Um, and be have a, have a lot of time, you know. Take be aware that the, the process can take a lot of time. For example, with the um, you know let emails back and forward to the Dali Foundation, they were you know sometimes slow in coming back. So I think at the end of the day, this this project was pretty much up to the wire in having it published, you know, so you, you need to you need to give yourself a lot of time um, when you're dealing in a project that involves lots of different bits of copyright. Um, and another thing is uh, get everything in writing, get all the important details in writing. You might want to speak to somebody, you know, to uh, sort of create a relationship with them so that they're, you know, you, they, they're I, I, that's what I would suggest in the first instance is phoning somebody, you know, having a conversation, but then all the important details, get them in writing because that is invaluable um, looking back on, um, you know, the correspondence. Um, because another project I worked on, um, there was a lot of changes of staff within the organisation I was dealing with. Um, so, you know, there, there can be a high turnover of people in organisations. So I was having to... Um, keep the process going all the time, you know, like make sure it's always active. Yeah, well, it's because, of course, it's not their priority, is it? It's, it's your exactly. priority to get this thing made and, and, and not theirs. Smashing. So, and you also, there's another example you said to me that you, you, you'd done some work with the Hebrides Ensemble and you were, I don't know if there was anything else you wanted to add from that. that about, yes. you know, it's like a different different yeah. set of problems and different solutions, I guess. Yeah, that was a project where the Hebrides Ensemble were thinking about making a, a VR piece to go with a, a concert they were planning. Now, this was for the concert and the VR piece depended on um, getting funding to do it. So it was for a funding bid to Creative Scotland um, for this piece of work. Um, I'd never worked in VR before, um, so that the idea was to take some of Goya's paintings 
and have them in a walkthrough VR experience while music was played. Um, so my, the, the first thing I did was went to the Prada Gallery in um, Madrid and they never got back to me. So it was, you know, it was a real slog. Um, and also, you know, with there was um, a deadline on getting this funding bid submitted. submitted. So um, I think looking back, um, and I, I looked back at the correspondence first, you know, for today, and it actually started off in, I think it was December, the correspondence started, and it went on till March. You know, it was just a ridiculous um, time scale. Um, so and and also they they said well we need to know exactly how you want to use this. I think eventually they passed me on to a company that licenses um, images in behalf of museums. But the, because we weren't entirely sure what we wanted to do at the time, and then there were other questions came up during the process. Um, so if we use these images, if we're licensed to use them for a VR experience, are we also can we also use them in on the stage? Can we also use them in promotional material? So again, there was a lot of questions that were coming up during the process, and it would have been much better in retrospect for everybody to sit down at the beginning and go, right, exactly how are these images going to be used? Um, and, you know, uh, just have everything down in a document um, that, you know, explained it was clear to everybody that could be saying, oh, you know, how are these rights going to be used and what do we need to clear? How long are we going to use the rights for? If this piece is filmed and made available online, that's another set of rights, you know, so the, the, it can be very complicated and to sit down and have everything very clear at the beginning is um, invaluable, you know, and to be aware of the time scale. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very struck, that's the kind of advice you. That, that's almost advice for life, isn't it? <laughs> kind of know where you're going and, and really organise. But, it, you know, you're covering some of the points that, of the questions that we have already been asked. So I think we'll, we'll come back to some of that. And just to finish, Jill, with, and before I invite Steve to join. Um, so it, it sounds like, you know, some of these are quite, they're, they're kind of, it's quite a lot to work through, isn't it? And you talked, particularly in your the first example, it's about doing de de something you didn't know about. Um, how did you build your confidence in, in dealing with rights? Because it, I can imagine it could be quite a daunting experience. Yes. Um, well, I would say just ask um, the questions that you may think are stupid, but ask them anyway, you know, because that's, you learn um, through making mistakes sometimes, you know, that's often the best way to learn. Um, and just be, uh, just be aware that you have to, um, you know, that, that don't take it for granted that you can that you can use anything. You know, always ask the always ask the questions. Um, and now, if I'm working on a project, the first thing I'll do is if there are different bits of rights clearance. You know, like that. That's uh, I just write everything down so that I have a document and you know knowing what I have to clear, and sharing that with other people involved in the project and making them aware as well that you know these are. Um, areas that we have to clear rights for before we even start out on, um, you know, the production. So it's in a pre-production stage. You must have everything really clearly identified as to the rights that you, you need to clear for a project. Yeah, and, and you're echoing what what Jamie said. Really, he called it an IP register. It's it's that it's that same sort of process, isn't it? Of really knowing what what it is you're looking at and what yeah. might you be looking at. Yeah, and ask, ask other people, you know, ask other people who may have worked in the, the, you know, a similar area or have experience, you know, um, don't ever be afraid of asking um, uh, for help, I would say, because people are generally, and you know, will, will want to help you, you know. Lovely. Thank you so much. So um, I'm going to ask you to um, turn your camera off now, Jill, and we'll get you back after the break to sort of, to take part in the panel and answer the, the more the general questions from the audience. So that's a great intro. Thank you very much. See you in a bit. Oh, it's non-stop, isn't it? And here comes Steve. Hello. Hello, Steve. <laughs> hello. Welcome hello. Bye. Our panelists for today. Um, so to start, the same as the others, you know, I, I, I described you as a content acquirer, but we could have also called you an mm. archive researcher. Do you want to just give us a sense of your role and what the work that you do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it, there isn't really a 
a term that covers it really i mean I, it, from what jill was just saying i i very often come in where um people are in a position of having looked at material of which there is obviously a huge amount and increasing all the time and then they they want advice on how best they can proceed with using it so um it's it, it it's a kind of curious thing in my career i've moved very much from um uh, acquiring the material in the first place when it was very much closed collections and it was a matter of knowing the terrain if you like of how to go and go about finding material and now it's much more that because the technology has moved in in the direction it has I very much come in a little bit later when people have a clearer idea about what they want to use because they've looked at things like YouTube and, and they've gone on Getty Images or Google Images um, and they found a lot of material that they like, but they don't always know how to how to go about using it. And that's that's where hopefully I would come in at that point. And 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 the idea really for me is, is to be able to steer them around the potholes of which there are many. Um, and and get them on a proper path. I mean, I think the I mean the all the, the things that, that previous people, Jamie and Jill, have been talking about. Um, the IP register is an absolutely brilliant idea. It very rarely happens in my experience because people don't really think through all the implications of what they're doing at, when they're looking for material. It is so easy to find uh, to go looking for material and find some fantastic um, whether it's footage or stills or audio and then to get wedded to the idea of using this and then think oh god how am I going to do that and that's a really difficult job to come in and say well actually I wouldn't use that I would use this you know and, and move people in a different direction so um it's it's a matter of getting people to be as flexible as they possibly can I mean that's the that's the the key to it and I think other other people have said exactly the same that actually not to be not to get ideas that are fixed about a project but to think well actually that would be good to use that and then start getting advice at that point I mean I there's no way I could possibly say well you know you shouldn't have started from here you should really have talked to me in the first place uh, because that's not a practical reality that's not what people do people now look they jump straight on google images and they find interesting pictures that they want to use mm. and then they think oh how am i gonna hopefully they think how, how am i gonna be able to use it so um hopefully i can come in at, a, at as early a stage as possible and steer them towards you know the 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 easier routes i mean something jill said just then about um agencies is is a classic case of where instead of finding an artwork which you can find a picture online and think oh that's what i want to use if instead of going to the gallery or the artist's estate um and trying to start negotiating at that point if they then if, if the client then thought about an agency that has already done all those arrangements with big galleries it is so much easier um and it, 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 it sort of smooths the path but you've got to know that and and sometimes People just go down the wrong path, simply not realizing that there are established channels. So Jill's point really about asking as many people as possible is, yeah. is probably the, the, the helpful starting yeah. point in all of that. Isn't uh, it? Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm, I, I often um, get involved in projects just purely at an advisory level. Um, straight off, you know, where where people say, "How would you go about doing this?" and I give them advice um long time before the project sometimes gets underway properly and just say well this is how you could do it and this is you know this is a way of approaching it and this is the kind of budget you'll need and all of those kind of considerations um because the the other thing that um, jill mentioned there's three elements of the period of time that you need to license something for the formats and the the territories those three areas are really crucial to get people to define right at the outset when you're really first talking about using material. Um, you've really got to think, especially now, because people tend to underestimate. They always underestimate what they think they're going to need. Um, so they say, well, I think it's just for UK and I think it's just going to be videogram or something like that. And you say, well, actually, videogram is very unlikely to be the the the. Um, the, 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 the container well videogram is what used to be okay. dvd and blu-ray right. and, and 
you know, disc based media. And, and really, that is so insignificant now that if if you hear people talking about that, you think, well, actually, no, that's that's like a sort of gateway to something else. And it's almost certainly some kind of streaming platform. Um, and, and so really, you're talking about something else entirely. So when people say, oh, yes, it's just a videogram, you think, well, actually, I doubt very much whether it is. And so, so, you, so those, you're saying... defining those elements is crucial. OK, OK. Um, and there's something else I wanted to ask you about. So, so you've 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 said pe peri what period, what formats might yeah. you be using? I suppose is the open question. Yes. And what territories? Where do you think people are going to see this? That's your sort of starting yeah. point for understanding. Yeah. So, yes. so that that's the kind of one really useful tip. And then there was something else that I wanted to pick up on that Jill said about how people asking her how things were going to be, how things are going to be used. Because one of the projects that you worked yeah. on with the space. Um, it's Believers Are But Brothers, which is, um, for anyone mm. who doesn't know, it was a, a theatre piece, which is really about the radicalisation of, of young people, young M Muslims. And it, it uses a lot of kind of um, adverts and pieces of footage from different organisations, but they, mm. they are maybe not being, those the organisations behind the adverts and so on might not be represented in this particular film. Um, in the way that they would particularly appreciate, shall yeah. we say. So I just wanted to, yeah. so Jill's point about thinking about how you, you know, how you're using the work um, and what mm. impact it mm. has on rights owners. Do you want, is there anything more that you can say about that? Yeah, I think, I mean, the, as in a way, as with the, the kind of formats and territories and all the rest of it, you have to think through the implication of every piece of content like that. So, um, I mean, with, with with the one that you're mentioning there, there, obviously there are things that that are kind of be news sources that you think, well, actually that's fine because a news source gathers material for a particular purpose. And as long as they're happy with the context, you're gonna put it in. Um, and that's, that's become more contentious recently. Um, but you know that you license the material. Material you go to AP or Getty or whoever, and you license that material for use in your production. Um, those places have got much more um, uh, sensitive to the context because obviously, if you're using it in a in a non strictly news actuality context, that makes things a little bit different, and they they do worry about that. Um, so you, there are bridges to cross there because I've been involved in a lot of kind of you know. Um, factual dramas which use actuality footage but they're putting them into a fictional content context essentially you know so so those those are kind of really crucial issues you have to think through I mean it's it, uh, you have to also have a a scale of something that Jamie alluded to a kind of scale of risk because there are some elements if you're using like the, the example you you gave if you're using um you know um Al Qaeda videos or something like that. Um, that is um, uh, one risk, which is pretty small. If you're using that and you found it online, obviously that there, there aren't copyright issues, um, you know, involved in most of the, that kind of content. But you if say you're using because Al Qaeda wouldn't come after you saying you used. Uh, well, yes, essentially, yes. I mean, nobody is going to claim that as copyright. Um, I mean, there used to be a thing that. Um, uh, a category that that myself and my other colleagues use, which would talk about handouts, which was normally, I mean, it's, it's PR already. If a company um, produces a new product and they want it to make it onto the news, they give handouts to all the news companies. And, um, and that was regarded as fair game. That has now been, um, uh, you know, rode back on to some extent now, because obviously what is given out as a as as PR for a new product. If you come along a year later and you think, hey, I want to use that product in a production I'm doing, then it's no longer good PR for the company. So you have to think very carefully about that. Um, and it, that applies to uh, political handouts, company handouts, um, all kinds of things really, which are which are basically uh, the the feature film companies used to give out promotional material, which were, they were more than happy to use, for people to use. And then they started putting conditions on it, like saying there's a window, a promotion window. So if you used it outside the six months in which they were promoting the film, 
then they wanted to reclaim the IP on it, essentially. They wanted to reclaim the copyright. Um, so, and, and a lot of people argued with that. So, well, no, this is a handout. This is something you're promoting a film and we should be able to use it freely. Um, and, you know, there have been a lot of arguments about that. So those are things you have to be very wary of. And of course, now, a lot of those times, a lot of those packages um, uh, that companies release end up on YouTube. And it's a free for all there. So if they're not if they're not clearly marked as being copyrighted by, of of a of the producer, then people tend to assume that it's free. And of course, it isn't. It's uh, you know there are conditions behind it. So you're saying wherever you pick your material up from, think about yes. where it's come from beforehand, and who you might. Own. It, that, I, I would say that is the biggest thing of all. Um, the, the the trouble is now everything it looks so transparent. You can find so much material, but it it very rarely is as straightforward as it appears. I mean, sometimes people find home movies on on YouTube, and they think, oh, that's great. That's exactly what I want to use. And you think, well. Where did that come from? And quite often, it doesn't come from the person who posted it on YouTube. So you think, oh, it's fine. And, and sometimes you can even get the permission from the person who posted it and say, yeah, it's fine. Use that. That's, that, that, that you know, that home movies of the Mount Battens or whatever, you know, at home. No, not a problem. And of course, they don't necessarily have that right to give you. Um, and so everything is, is there. You've got to look behind the image every single time. And that is absolutely crucial for everything. And it, especially now that there are so many um, composites, there's so many amalgams. You know, most productions have lots of different material in them, whether it's stills or audio elements or different clips. And so people don't even regard it as being acquired material. It's just part of the, the production. It's the layers. It's the layers. It's the layers. Up. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. You've, got to, you've got to peel back the layers. All right. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. That's really helpful. Okay. So we've had a kind of a, a real overview from three different perspectives and four and also from the setup from Fiona in the first place. Let's take a five minute break now. So you can have a bit of a think and then we'll come back to the whole panel and put some of the questions you sent in advance and some of the questions that have arisen. We've just, I've just seen one about formats. We'll come back to that after the break. So it's 11.52 now. So we'll start again at 11.57. Thank you. Okay. We've got quite a lot of questions to get through. Um, lots of we've been asked already. Um, let's just start with those. So I'm going to ask our panellists, um, Steve and Jill and mm -hmm. Jamie to rejoin us and then I'll get Fiona, I'll get you to join us a bit later on towards the end of the session. So um, thank you for coming back to us. Um, I wanted to start, I'm going to ask Jill this question and the others might have something else to add to it, which was the first one that we were asked earlier, which is um, somebody saying, I am creating an immersive virtual reality experience where the participant can walk through many rooms in a house. And I was thinking about what that you were talking about with your Hebrides example. In some rooms, a TV set broadcasting clips of the Golden Girls TV series, which is what, maybe 30 years old, but recently was shown again, I think I saw it on Channel 5. What licensing rights for the clips do I need to consider and how would I approach this? What would your, what would your overview be for that person? Um, the first thing I would do is find out which um, production company um, made the um, the Golden Girls series. Um, contact them. Contact. I mean, it's been shown on mm. various different networks. I think you know. So I would go to the production company in the first instance and ask them um, uh, if it's possible to reproduce, um, and if so, how much would it cost. Um, and the first thing I would do is be very clear about how you want to use the, um, you know, just saying I want to use it in a, a VR walkthrough. They'll want to know what context is that going to be used in, you know, what other, um, mm. uh, you know, images or sounds or whatever, uh, you know, mm. so you probably have to, um, you know, be quite detailed in its use. Um, and they, they'll, they'll ask for uh, written information. So I would suggest having a, 
um, something prepared, a piece of background um, material, you know, a document prepared that you could send to the copyright holder um, that gives them very clear information on, on how it's used, where it's going to be used, um, you know, which platforms will it be used on? Will that VR experience also be available online? You know, will um, the the, the um, maybe stills from the the, the programmes be used in promotional material? You know, there's lots of different things to think about before you actually get to the stage of um, contacting the, the the rights holders. Um, apparently, it's Disney. Mm -hmm. It's Disney that own the rights. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was, I was going to say, the, um, it's very unusual for the, the original production company to own the rights on something like that, because it's been either acquired or, or basically paid for by a much bigger company. Um, and Disney, the moment you say Disney, you think uh, that is, it's a red flag in that Disney are very difficult to deal with. And... Um, and, and pretty strict, actually. I mean, they 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 are highly likely to come after you if you use something like that unlicensed. So Disney is one of those companies that really you you need to take very seriously. So the moment you that comes into the frame, you you have to think very carefully of all the things that you're you're saying about that. Um, uh, the the one thing I'd, I'd add about context, I mean, I, I agree about entirely about context, but one thing you've got to be very careful of is when you spell out the context in which you're using something, um, if you're dealing with corporate um, agencies, um, and that is usually applies to commercial companies, not necessarily film distributors, but commercial companies, uh, there is a very narrow line between giving them full context and going into the area of script approval, which is very bad news. If they sense that they can um, in any way control how you're wanting to use their content, then you are in a bit of trouble because they they then start wanting to dictate how it's used. Um, I mean, a, a classic example is in dramas, um, if anything filmed in a bar, um, the alcohol companies are very sensitive about underage drinking. And one of the things that they very often ask is, are there any people in the scene who you could construe reasonably to be underage? And of course, that's a really difficult thing for, in a drama production, incredibly difficult thing to, to put in context. And they want that kind of um, agreement in place before they'll say yes. That's why you very rarely see alcohol uh, named brands in dramas. You very rarely see beer names or alcohol names on bottles for that reason, because they are so difficult to deal with. OK, lovely. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry to butt in, but we've got quite we've got lots of questions to get through. So let's okay. just we'll keep sure, sure. So it, it. That sounds like that might be one of those points where a plan B and a plan C might be the, the way forward. Be thinking about what yes. how else can I approach this if if I don't get what I need from Disney, because it sounds definitely, definitely. Smashing. OK, thank you very much. Then um, the the next question I was going to ask um, Jamie about this, which is kind of because you work so much with new technologies and things. Somebody was asking about formats and saying, how do you you know, we, we're talking a lot about thinking into the future and what formats you want to use. How do you accommodate for the development of future technologies that don't already exist? I'm thinking around that. <laughs> it, I mean, crystal ball. It's. I mean, but no, it's a really good question because <laughs> I, when I when I was at um, when I was at um, PlayStation Sony, um, there was games which were developed sort of early '90s and then and then re-released, looking to re-release them on new platforms or using new technology. So looking to use them across digital platforms. And there was content in there. Uh, I know we're not talking about music, but music specifically, but other content. And you look back at the agreements, it's very clear. Oh, we're just releasing this for a particular system or in physical format. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the thing. You, you sort of, you've got to sort of look at it. I mean, fortunately, the, the sort of the distribution by digital has probably taken a lot of the old physical content distribution questions away and things. But it's really looking at it and saying, well, what do we want to do if we are creating a VR production for um, a VR production for Oculus? 
well, why wouldn't you then want to release that on other platforms? So certainly the content you get, your starting point as well, we want to release on Oculus, but really we want to make sure we can release on any VR headset or future technology headset. Then it's sort of a case of, well, mm. what if we want to, what if those can't have an Oculus headset and they want to stream it on YouTube as a sort of a 360 rendered out experience? Well, yeah, we want to have that. And so really it's this, element of thinking what do we want to do and it's almost starting really we want to be able to do anything any derivative works and anything based on this and then mm. see if you need to be pulled back but i guess in a way it, it's I say it's not crystal ball gazing because digital distribution is taken away it's more thinking about what do we see this going to and and the, and the, the derivatives and again Stephen mentioned it with disney you'll often see when they buy rights to a book or to an idea, it covers everything. It covers derivatives, it covers spin-offs, it covers sort of um, multimedia productions, interactive productions, merchandise. And it's that sort of thing and thinking, mm. this IP can be used for just a very single granular piece, mm. but actually it can be used across many sort of formats. So, it's trying to be as broad as possible and, and, and trying to sort of keep that focus really. Thank you. Uh, Fiona, Fiona wanted to make a, an additional comment on this as well. It was the thing that I think we, we've all said, which is there's a difference between it being in advance of making a project where you, as you know, as, as Jamie says, you may have no idea where that may go in the future. You can have that conversation and you can include in that kind of contractual discussion, you know, kind of all media, whether now or in the future invented. It, mm. it, what, what you're trying to secure from the copyright holder is that they won't restrict you. You're not, you know, you you may you will have to go back and pay them more money. They're not gonna, they're not gonna say, or just imagine any technology forever and a day and never pay me anything else. Mm -hmm. But you can at least agree with them in advance that there is some capacity and flexibility in the contractual arrangement that if you were to go back in the future when something, some new technology is there, that you've set that ground route, you've set the ground rules to say that that conversation is acceptable, or you've let them say no, because we're already well aware that AI may, you know, we're not going to even consider giving you a right of approval already for a technology that doesn't exist. So, so I think there's a difference between, yeah, whether you're, what you're buying out up front and what you are agreeing is in the envelope of discussion. Lovely. I'd just, add, I'd just add on that point, and I, you, you mentioned AI, we're increasingly seeing content, so if you're commissioning, say, a piece of a voiceover um, actor or someone to provide some content, or an artist, increasingly seeing restrictions in those licenses for the use of for any machine learning or AI purposes, and again, that's important to sort of to think about, because it's really sort of putting a very clear stopper on you using your content to sort of help train another algorithm or something. And again, it, it's showing that the sort of the rights and the overview of rights is very prominent in, in today's society. And I think people are becoming increasingly aware of this non, non sort of I mean, tangible physical right that they have to control and putting the restrictions on it. And AI is really sort of bringing that to the forefront as well so again i mm. even in, when you're looking at those types of things it's it's those types of restrictions that can come into play as well and i, I guess the point i'm flagging is content creators are becoming increasingly aware of the rights they own quite rightly so um and so again this sort of element of taking action protecting rights someone's done this someone's using that without uh, my consent we're, we're increasingly seeing that type of query come through so it's, it's just another sort of focus <laughs> point, really. Thank and you. Also, I think, and I would just, and also, you know, that, that it, it, it varies internationally. But for example, in America now, increasingly, you are seeing people exert biographic rights. So, you know, you can't just kind of include a reference in a script to, you know, to a, to a significant figure without gaining permission from either their estate or them. Now, that's not something that's, you know, kind of, acceptable in the UK yet but if you're publishing something that will be seen in America it's increasingly there that people are sort of trademarking identities 
and asking you to acquire yeah. permission to use the name you know not just the likeness but also the name so you know it's it, this will get Absolutely. more and more contentious and as Jamie says and, and Steve's you know attesting to you know as as the machinery of digital gets more complicated and cleverer people are going to close down a lot what they're prepared to discuss putting in their in their agreements thank you I, I was going to ask the next question to Steve, and it's actually a follow on. Sure. Part of it's a follow on to what you were just saying, Fiona. So the others of you might have some some questions. It's really about you know it's what we're talking about, but on a a, a, a different scale. So this this person is saying I'm making an audio walk around a library, and I wish to use sections of texts from books, quotes from newspaper articles, and already existing music, which we'll look at in September when we come back to this. But, mm. but so using text quotes from newspapers, it's just, it's, it's a walk around a library um, and rights clearances for these and how to go about doing them would be welcome. So one is thinking about how do you clear rights? But the second part says, the story focuses on real events in the life of Captain John Franklin, who was an Arctic explorer in the 1700s. Is there a protocol for using someone's story? So I'm interested in what you were just saying, but also thinking about <laughs> You know, yeah. in this situation, we're not thinking necessarily about a worldwide broadcast date. We're talking about an audio experience that might happen in a in a library. Perhaps people put headsets on. So there's sort of two things there. Yeah. Really. But yeah. do you want to start with the thinking about how do you clear the text from books and articles, and then back to Fiona's point about yeah. the, the character. It's it's a, a um, I mean, that's a big gray area, the question of text, because um, there's always been the right of quotation. Um, so if you are um, and, and that is a matter of um, uh, the substance, basically, the amount that is used, um, very often people have quoted lines particular lines from copyrighted work, and they are that is acceptable because that is uh, that is thought of as a quotation. If you're using whole paragraphs of something, then that's a different thing. Obviously, the date of that would indicate that most of the material is likely to be out of copyright anyway. Um, I, it, obviously, it, it depends on the individual text um, and work that's being quoted, but it sounds to me like a lot of that would would be copyright free, so there wouldn't be any kind of concern about that. In terms of newspapers, um, it, it it's always been for for audiovisual use, not for not for um, not for audio only. It's always been the case that um, if you show a certain amount of a newspaper article, um, that has been acceptable. Um, but if you show the whole piece, a whole column with a masthead, where there's likely also to be a trademark included, which is another issue altogether, um, then that definitely does need clearance. So it's 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 a judgment call, basically. You have to be very aware of, A, the copyright situation on the individual content, piece of content, and B, really what what the context is, how broad a context you're showing it in. If you're, if you're show, clearly showing it's from a magazine with a title and you show the masthead and the byline, then that is something where you are clearly using somebody's content. It needs to be licensed. And all the publishers, all the magazine and newspaper publishers will be only too happy to issue a license. Some of them are very expensive um, and unreasonable about it. But um, they will all, they nearly always talk to you and they nearly always have a syndication department that will help you. So is your the first port of call is to ring them up, is to get in touch and ask them? Um, no, I think the first port of call is, is, to, is to make a judgment call about the individual piece of content. If, okay. if you are, nobody's ever going to say, um, no, don't worry about it these days. Um, the, it, the moment you contact a publisher, they will start, start the meter running essentially so you have to make a judgment call if you think it, it qualifies as a quotation so you're not actually um showing anything that identifies it clearly as a piece of content that belongs to a company then then you shouldn't contact them because the moment you contact them you are setting hairs running okay okay so i'm just i'm, I'm interested to hear from, from J J uh, jill your process on making that a judgment call how, how would you decide whether you were going to contact somebody or not? Um, I think, I mean, I've used uh, quotes before, you know, in 
get actors reading quotes from books and radio programmes, you know, and um, I agree <laughs> with what you said there, you know, I would, um, I would be, uh, I would be using something that, you know, I, I, I know that, I, that, that, that wouldn't be a, a, a rights problem. Anything longer than a quotation, you know, I would always be wary of using it because you don't want to, um, you don't want to have something that you've produced and you've maybe alerted um, a publisher that you really shouldn't have done. And mm. then you have, you've made a series which has various quotes throughout it and then they turn around and go, wait a minute, you know that. And the whole series has to be taken down. So I would be, um, I would always ask advice basically, mm. you know, uh, in the first instance, I would say to um, somebody who I, I, I knew had produced something similar, I would say, I would ask advice, what should I do here, you know? Um, and if there was nobody to ask, I would err on the side of caution, always err on the side of caution when it comes to, to rights, because as a freelancer, you know, you don't want to have, um, you know, a piece of work taken down that you potentially don't get paid for because, it, you know, you've made a mistake with a, a rights situation, mm. you know? So, um, yeah, that would be yeah. my answer. Thank you. Caution. Thank you very much. And it was another opportunity to plug our digital rights toolkit. Absolutely. Is, yeah. I mean, that really is such, it is such a, a really good piece of, um, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of something to go to. You know, it's really helpful. I've used it myself on various occasions in the past when making content for, you know, a range of people. So I would, yeah, absolutely. It should be, it's, it's, a, it's a first stop document, I would say, because it gives a really good overview. Brilliant. OK. Um, and uh, I've just, I'm sort of picking up on some of the language that Steve used. So one of the things he, he mm. talked about was out of copyright. And we've got another link to put into chat, which is a document that the National Archives have put together. But it has a really excellent sort of flow chart at the end for working out whether something is out of copyright or not, which is pretty useful. But there's other things. And I was going to ask you all about... Um, um, some of the sort of popular, the, the language that's used and, and misconceptions. So, so I'll, I guess I'll come back to Jamie. Um, what people talk about things like, um, we've talked about quotations out of copyright, meaning something isn't, it, it was produced so long ago that it doesn't, no longer is you know, a requirement, but We'll point to the National Archives for that one. But then there's other terminology that you hear people using the term fair dealing. Jamie, what do you what does fair dealing mean? And can it be used as a kind of defense almost if you haven't? Yeah, I mean, it, it, that, I think we, we come across that quite a lot, actually, in the sense of, oh, I've, I've only used this short bit of footage and, and surely it's fair dealing or I'm just sort of using this. It's not really the main context. It isn't that fair dealing. I mean, it, it's it's not really. I mean, the short answer is fair dealing is really a sort of a narrow, very narrowly construed sort of area, and it and it's sort of you again the National Archives document is quite quite helpful for this, but it it really is related to specific activities, maybe educational or or other and and very very small pieces, and not for commercial use in in for the most part. So effectively, if you are creating something for commercial gain and you're using copyright work in there, then really the majority of, I'd say, would not be subject to um, fair dealing. And, and that's the rule. And, and it, it, it can slightly differ in the US. Um, but again, it, it's back to this point of if you're using content in a commercial setting, then really the sort of the defense of fair dealing is not really one that can be deployed um, that sort of often. There are there are sort of elements to say, sort of exclusions to that rule and and sort of reporting and and sort of satire and things. But again, it's not it's the fundamental position I'd say is not to sort of just rely upon fair dealing. Thank you. Um, just to note, we've about roughly ten minutes left, a little bit over. So there's still a, a fair few things to get through. Um, but just can I just pick up are there any other um for you Jamie is there any other misconceptions about copyright that people come to you with that would be helpful to clarify here 
Um, I think, I mean, I think I said the main one on the start, these, this sort of view that you can just simply take um, an image from the internet um, and, and sort of utilize it and make free changes or whatever. I think that's a common misconception. I think I did see in the chat, there was a question around sort of Getty and things. Again, sort of, you, you may think, oh, I can just go and license an image from these platforms and I'm fine, but you'll actually find that even they have restrictions on their own content, for example. And so again, you've just got to be careful. And when I say restrictions on their own content, it might be that it features someone famous or, or, or an image of an individual and again, the restriction is, yes, you can use this the, the picture because we have the rights from the photographer, but actually we don't necessarily have clearance from the individual featured. So unless you're particularly just using this fade for a, a news piece or something else, it's not clear. And so again, there's that common misconception that, oh, I've paid for it. I've got all the rights I necessarily need. And it's really, unfortunately, down to the sort of fine print or, or sort of just checking checking you you sort of have it set out what you want to use it for and and clearing it on that basis really okay thank you and can i just check somebody's asking if an arts organization is a not-for-profit are the rules different mm, um no because it's still they're still a subject to the copyright um position so again again and this this is where i think a judgment call comes into play as well and some of the things because it, it comes to that element. I know um, uh, Stephen was talking about sort of this point about getting consent to things, but it comes down to sort of looking at all of the context. And, and for example, video games is a good example. A lot of them have restrictions on the use of their content um, for certain uh, purposes. It's a judgment call at the end of the day. You may have an, an entity at the end who is not going to really sort of bring a claim against someone and, and a not-for-profit, how is it being used? And that's, that's really where it's going to come to. How is it being used? Now, if it's being used in a commercial, to commercialise sort of a, a brand and, and use it sort of to promote the not-for-profit, then you're probably into a tricky area. If it's being used in some other fashion, you might sort of think, well, actually, there isn't sort of so much of an issue, but it's still about that commercialization point. What are you trying to use it for? Okay, smashing. Mm. And there's another question from Andy Brogan, which sort of re reflects that in, in the chat. So, but uh, we might come back to that later if we have time, but I think it's sort of the same questions would apply. Is there any other common misconceptions that we haven't spoken about, uh, J J Jill or Steve? Is there anything that you would like to say briefly to, yeah, I to can, get people to warn? No, I can, I can think of um, something that I use sound effects quite a lot in. Um, uh, and you know illustrating stories for um bbc learning so it's educational um and i use a site called free sound which is you don't have to pay for the um the sound archives the, the sound that you use it's a a site that is user led you know so it's it's people uploading the sound effects that they've recorded but um, there are four different um, licenses attached to. There's a Creative Commons that you can use anywhere. There's um, an attribution license, um, and there's an attribution license for only commercial use. So even though it says that these sounds are available freely, the way that they are used, um, uh, you know, the license attached to the sounds is um, they're all different. So it's it's something to be aware of. Um, I, I can think of you know using gifts on material as well. You know that some mm -hmm. of the gifts are have different licenses attached to them. So be aware when you're going to a website that says copyright free, there are different licenses attached um, to that material. Lovely. Yeah, I think that's uh, just, no, that just, go on, go on, Stephen. The, the, sorry, go on. I was just gonna say on that point, on, on, on just on Jill's point, Again, sites like Turbo Squid and other sites where you can get models, 3D models of, of assets and things. Again, you sort of may go on there and think, I'm paying for the model. You are, you're buying the model, but depending what the model is of, you may still need further rights from the actual sort of um, either the car manufacturer. And again, this is this risk based. If you're going on Turbo Squid and buying a model of a of just a generic house. You're probably absolutely fine if you're going on there and saying i specifically want this particular bmw model and i'm buying the model so surely i'm fine 
you're, you're neglecting that there's BMW rights in there somehow. It could be for the trademarks, it could be other, other issues. So again, you, that's, I think, Jill's point. You've got to be super careful when you're just thinking, oh, I am still getting the license. And I know it sounds all doom and gloom, but it, 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 isn't, it isn't as bad as that. It's just, just sort of doing that sense check of, oh, I'm using a famous brand. Is it right that I'm just getting something off the internet for a fairly low price? That just it's sort of that sniff test. It doesn't quite mm. seem right. So I better just double check, basically. This and um, mm. just sort of going back to and mm. Andy's question, sorry, which is about um, the, the question that's in the chat is about um, been going. Um, somebody works for an LGBTQ charity wanting to use footage that includes hate speech. Um, it's not for commercial gain, and, and the, the rights holders to the footage are saying they would like them to pay for the footage. And, and the question is, is there a way around this using fair dealing as it seems inappropriate, which is about the, I suppose it's your sniff test from the other end. Mm. It seems inappropriate to have to pay for hate speech against the community we represent. And it does, it does seem really horrible, mm. but I'm afraid you've made the fatal error. You've asked them already, and Steve will yeah. attest this. Yeah. If you've done the sniff test and decided mm. that you thought it would be unreasonable, this, you know, your hate speech against the community that you're making a film, mm. you know, for, but you asked the rights holders already. So you've acknowledged that they exist and that they do own rights, and that immediately wipes out fair dealing as a possibility mm. for you. Yes. Sorry, can, can, I, can I add something? Can I add something? I think we'll have yeah. to move on, Steve, because we've. Because I'm really sorry, but we've got five minutes left, and I just well, there's just, one other question I want to get. Unless okay. it's really, really quick. It's just it's really quick. quick. Um, the important thing is not to communicate with them in the first place. That, as, <laughs> that's as, what I just said. You know, yeah. That's that's exactly right. Because one, if you are going to fair deal something, and that's a a, a big issue, but if you are going to fair deal it. One of the things that disqualifies you from doing that is entering into any kind of discussion. You shouldn't, I mean, a lot of people go to commercial entities and talk to them and then find it's too expensive and then say, can we fair deal it? And you can't. Once you've started negotiations, you can't fair deal something on the basis of money alone. So that's, the, you know, that's one of those issues that you've got to be careful of. Okay. Um so it was just one other, the, the last question I wanted to ask you was, you know, we're mindful that lots of people of dealing with limited well everybody has a limited budget and some more than others how do you know what's the right amount of money or how much money you need to put aside for rights is there is there any kind of rate card any kind of steer and i'm, I'm sort of gonna fiona's shaking her head a bit mm. <laughs> no because it just depends you know hugely mm. on you know, job, you know, are you asking for permission to publish this around the world? Are you asking for permission to publish it on multiple forms of media? Um, you know, so it, it, it's really hard. And then how much underlying copyright exists? You know, if it's a performance, then obviously the performers take a larger share of any copyright fees than, than somebody who has a photograph used in a set design, you know. So to say there's a rule of thumb is, is it's, almost impossible to to kind of yeah set that mm. but but never underestimate it sniff test then set a really healthy budget for the rights that you will have to pay for because you can always redistribute that later if you've managed to do a brilliant deal but yeah be be really really anticipate that some things uh, music which we've excluded from this conversation because there'll be another webinar on that but but you know you really can't underestimate how much money you should set aside okay thank you so what i'm going to do now we've just got a couple of minutes left i'm just going to get you the panel to think is there one last tip that you would want to share um i think we might run a few minutes over because the, you know, just to get, give you a ch one chance to sort of say something. So, but it would have to be a very short thing. There's, is there one other piece of advice or recommendation you want to give? And while we, while you're having a think about that, I'm going to ask everybody who's on the uh, on the call to do our evaluation, uh, because we find that if we leave it right to the end, we don't get very many evaluations. It's so so helpful. It will take you a minute, two minutes max, to fill in these questions. Then we'll come back to the panel for any any last thoughts. Thank you very much. And also, um, pa panel, there's a question from Steph Roberts at 12.25. I don't know if, if anybody had an answer to that. We haven't picked that one up yet. 
if you could put the answer into the, if you could write the answer into the chat, if you have one, that would be great. And then I think we've covered all the questions. Uh, yeah, I think the short answer is yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the, the short answer is yes, but, but most rights holders, if you tell them it's for educational use, will set a lower tariff on what they would expect from you in terms of payment. Smashing, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so while people might be finishing off their evaluation, just, uh, is there a last thought? Does, it, does anybody yeah. have one that they'd like to share? Yeah. Jim, go on. Yeah. Oh, I saw Jill's yeah. mouth move first, then I'll come oh, sorry. to you. Okay. Jill. Oh yeah, um, be prepared, have a good idea of how you want to use the um, the material, um, you know, uh, and, and communicate that to everybody who's involved in the project. Thank you very much. Steve? Yeah, just the interesting copyright implications of the whole AI thing is that for years, agencies have produced sound alike, um, production library music, um artwork that is look-alike and ai is now moving into that territory very fast and that um so it's actually catching up and the thing that that the agencies have used for forever so if you wanted to use a youtube track youtube track and you couldn't afford it you could go to a production library and get a very close sound alike but of course ai is now muddying that because what's happening is ai is taking all of that and creating close but not original material. And that's that's going to have enormous implications on everything. So your advice would be to be careful. Be very careful, yes, because obviously there is a basically what's going on now is a fight back from the traditional agencies. So Getty is in a fight with Stability AI that's basically taken all of its pictures and is using it as an artistic reference for their AI production. Okay. And so okay. there is a massive fight going on, and that's that's something to be very aware of uh, all the time caution again thank you very much uh, um jamie do you have a last piece of advice or a tip i mean i'd i'd say look it, it, don't treat this as sort of go away and say oh crikey that's all doom and gloom and i've got to i've got to sort of sit and sort of just fundamentally think about absolutely everything i think it's the practical points and a lot of the time we find if there is something if you ultimately do find your face with a claim or something the point of going back is saying, well, have you taken reasonable steps? Have we, and, and that's always a starting point, being able to demonstrate that you did sort of start to look at sensible approaches. Mm -hmm. You didn't just take an image and say, oh, I'm going to stick this on a T-shirt and start selling them online and I'll just deal with it if someone comes. You thought, well, actually, I've looked at this. Do I need a license? You've questioned it. And then ultimately, if you do go ahead without a license, what are the reasons for that? Why? And it, it's that sort of starting point of, so sort of looking at what are you using and what should be there. And, and, and again, I think it's not, these are not unsurmountable problems unless you've just blatantly gone out and said, I know they own it, but I'm just going to do it anyway. Then you're into perhaps a, a very difficult area and, and hard to get out of. But if you're approaching the right direction and, and trying to look at it sensibly, I think you'll find that even if you did come across an issue, you can get it resolved. And insurance, and insurance, I'll leave you with the thought of insurance. For anyone creating content, even to freelancers under limited entities, etc., look at professional indemnity insurance. It's not the answer to everything, but a lot of people just assume, oh, I, I don't need insurance. It's not for me. To me, it's a fundamental piece of your sort of um, of your company. You should look to sort of have your insurance in place as a sort of backup um, in the event that there is a claim, and that that's something that is missed by a lot of uh, a lot of freelancers and creatives yeah, i would i would absolutely second that yeah <laughs> thank you thanks ever so much and then and fiona do you is there a last piece of advice from you um yeah just i think probably you know as jamie said you know um you, you can always await claim so if you can't find a rights holder or you're not getting a response you can officially kind of create an await claim so you put a bit of money aside you make it really clear that you've done your absolute best to track down or get clearance from a rights holder and um, don't despair also just as jill said present what the work is about actually most rights holders are not horrible people who 
want to just you know, take all your money away from you. I think if you're clear about what the project is, who the audience is, you know, you will hopefully be able to come to a conclusion that doesn't uh, doesn't mean that you have to exclude footage. But yeah, and generally speaking, make sure your whole production team knows about this. If you're a producer, you're not being nasty, telling them they can't use a particular image or piece of music. You're trying to actually make sure the work is shareable and distributable. So get everybody to understand why you may be putting restrictions around what you can use. Lovely. Thank you very much. At which point um, we'll come to an end. I want to say thank you very much to everybody for participating in, in the webinar. And also thank you so much to all of our panel for sharing their knowledge and their experience so generously. Um, and we will be revisiting rights in the autumn and looking more at the, the performance rights and including music in that. So uh, all the information will be on the space website and out on our social platforms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank oh, you. and Nicola, yeah. She's a big special mention to Nicola for her ace, for her ace captioning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.